Hello and welcome everyone to this webinar entitled Combating Antimicrobial Resistance, Preserving Antibiotics Through Community Stewardship. This webinar is hosted by the National Collaborating Centre for Infectious Diseases, or NCCID. We gratefully acknowledge our partners supporting development and delivery of the webinar. And those are the Community Antimicrobial Stewardship Team at the British Columbia Centre for Disease Control, Antibiotic Wise, Do Bugs Need Drugs, and the Public Health Agency of Canada. I'm Harpa Isfeld Keeley, a Senior Project Manager with the NCCID. And for those not familiar with NCCID, we are one of six collaborating centres for public health in Canada. We are funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada to provide knowledge and evidence for use in public health planning and policy. NCCID is hosted at the University of Manitoba, situated on the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabeg, Anishinaabeg, Dakota Oyota, Denisolim, and Nehethawak or Ininwak nations. It is also in the heart of the homeland of the Métis Nation. At NCCID, we strive to honor the lands and their original caretakers in our work. We acknowledge that we are on Treaty One land. We recognize that this and other treaties have been implemented as part of the process of colonization intended to benefit some while harming others. We are committed to working with our partners toward reconciliation. Now, before uh, we begin our event today, I want to just share a few housekeeping items and um, to point out to you that the chat tab will be used by NCCID staff and speakers for the purpose of sharing information or links with the attendees. Instead, the, uh, for the Q&A discussion, we use the Q&A tab that you can see at the bottom. If you have technical problems, please email our technician at the address provided in the chat box. And Zishan, you'll provide your, um, uh, your email address there. And this webinar is taking place in English with simultaneous French interpretation, which can be accessed in the interpretation tab at the bottom right. So please find that interpretation tab if you're uh, looking for French language. So again, the question and discussion period, we will use the Q&A tab. You may enter questions there at any time, but please be aware that we will hold questions and answer those after the, question, uh, the presentations are, are uh, complete. You may uh, vote for other questions in the list. So please take a quick review of the questions that have come in uh, and uh, vote for any that you would like to, see, to hear answers to. So this will just help our speakers respond efficiently and cover the most pressing questions for us all. A recording of this webinar will be available on our website at nccid.ca under the webcast tab shortly after the webinar. Uh, and finally, uh, an evaluation questionnaire will also be shared after the webinar. Please complete that for us. NCCID and our partners will be very interested in your responses. And now uh, I would like to introduce you to our speakers. Joining us today, we have Dr. Edith Blundell Hill. And Edith is currently the medical director of the Antimicrobial Stewardship Program for Interior Health in BC, but she is also well known as, the, as a founder and medical director of the Do Bugs Need Drugs Program. She's active in uh, guideline and policy development and is a co-author of the Bugs and Drugs app that you may be familiar with. It's uh, uh, an antimicrobial reference guide widely used in Canada. And secondly, we are also joined by Kate O'Connor. Uh, Kate is a registered nurse educator with the Community Antimicrobial Stewardship Team at the BC Centre for Disease Control. She has worked as a public health nurse for over 14 years in varied areas, which uh, certainly includes antimicrobial stewardship. And Kate brings an equity-oriented approach to her work in health and social policy. Welcome to you both, Edith, Kate, Thanks 
very much for taking the time to share your work with us today. And at that, I want to turn it uh, to, to Edith to begin. Uh, Edith, you're, you'll just need to unmute, unmute your line. I knew I was forgetting something. Thank you everyone for joining us. I uh, want to um, thank you for being interested in our program. In 1997, the WHO declared that antimicrobial resistance was a global crisis and that all nations needed to address antimicrobial stewardship. As a result, we formed a small group of healthcare professionals pharmacists, nurses, and myself, and, and developed the Do Bugs Need Drugs program, which focused on three key messages. Uh, one, hand washing, the importance of hand washing in preventing infection, uh, that antibiotics did not work against viral illnesses, and that antibiotic resistance was truly a public health problem that all of us needed to be aware of. So with an unrestricted grant from the Alberta Lung Association, our group went to a medium-sized community in Northern Alberta, Grand Prairie, and we found that with education of healthcare professionals, the public and children, we were able to decrease antibiotic prescriptions by 12% in the winter months that we were studying compared to previous years. And so, and most importantly, we found that um, the, the value of teaching children in educating their parents. And this became, um, the child education became a major component of a program henceforth. The program then expanded to Northern Alberta and from then on was funded by Alberta Health. Um, the, um, in 2003, I moved to British Columbia and met Dr. David Patrick at BCCDC. His group had been following antibiotic prescriptions for years which is one thing we hadn't been able to do in Alberta. And so combining our two programs seemed to be a perfect opportunity for collaboration. So as you will see from Kate's presentation, in both Alberta and BC, the success of the Do Bugs Me Drugs program relied on a team approach with every member on equal footing towards a common goal. 90% of antibiotics are prescribed in the community. And we, if we are going to confront antimicrobial resistance, we have to do it in the community, not just in the hospital setting. So with that, I'll introduce Kate, who will tell you all about our program in British Columbia. Thank you, Edith. And my name is Kate O'Connor, and I'm a nurse educator at the BCCDC with the Community Antimicrobial Stewardship Team. Um, so for today, I just wanted to start by defining antimicrobial resistance, or AMR, even though most of you who are on this talk are probably already familiar with the topic, I just wanted to ensure we're all starting on the same page. So antimicrobial resistance happens when germs like bacteria develop the ability to defeat the medicine designed to kill them. So this means that the bacteria are not killed by the antibiotic, and they continue to grow. Resistant infections can be difficult and sometimes impossible to treat. So during this presentation, I'll first review the scale of the AMR public health threat, and then we'll look at the differences between hospital and community antimicrobial stewardship, or AMS, programs. And finally, we'll take a closer look at community stewardship programs that already exist in BC and Alberta, and we'll talk about the steps to starting community programs for areas that don't yet have existing provincial AMS programs established. Antimicrobial resistance is a serious threat to public health, as Edith was mentioning, and, our and it's also a threat to our modern healthcare system. AMR is recognized as one of the top 10 threats to public health by the World Health Organization and by the United Nations. So we will review some of the data on AMR in the world and then closer to home to better understand this global threat. Right now, there are about 1.3 million deaths a year globally associated with antimicrobial resistant bacterial infections. If we don't take concerted effort, 
it is estimated that by 2050, 10 million people a year could die from AMR. So that would be more deaths than cancer and diabetes combined. And the development of new antimicrobials is challenging, it's expensive, and it takes a long time to go from discovery to the market. Um, the discovery of these drugs and alternatives is a priority, but slowing resistant organisms is a more urgent public health priority. As bacteria develop and change resist, as bacteria change and develop resistance, there's no guarantee that a new antibiotic developed will remain effective for a long time. So every time the bacteria are exposed to the selection pressure from the antibiotics, the resistant strains are more likely to be favored and to spread. So reducing antibiotic, uh, sorry, reducing unnecessary antibiotic use is an important defense against emerging resistance. We can't just rely on new therapies. We need to change our patterns of use so that we preserve antibiotics now and into the future. And currently in Canada, there are about 24 million prescriptions dispensed by community pharmacies every year. And 30 to 50% of these prescriptions are estimated to be unnecessary. So what we need to do is decrease our usage patterns of this 30 to 50% of prescriptions without denying antibiotics to those who need them. Each unnecessary antibiotic puts us at more risk of resistant bacteria because the more the bacteria are exposed to the antibiotics, the more opportunity they have to develop resistance and spread. Patients with antibiotic resistant infections are at twice the risk of dying from their infection. And in Canada, the rates of methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA infections acquired in the community have increased as have antibiotic resistant gonorrhea and infections resistant to carbapenems, a last resort antibiotic. Right now in Canada, we have about 5,400 deaths a year associated with AMR, which is almost 15 people a day. So although the problem is expected to get much worse, it's already a large scale public health issue. With the increase in resistance, we also pose a threat to our modern healthcare system. Routine procedures like surgeries and cesarean sections would be very risky or impossible without antibiotic therapy. Treatments for cancer, organ transplants, and burn therapies all rely on antibiotics. And if we see AMR continue to increase, the costs and lives lost will be immense. So the report when antibiotics fail estimated that if AMR increases gradually from the rate we're at currently, which is 26% up to 40%, the result would be hundreds of thousands of lives lost and over $100 billion in healthcare spending. Dr. Teresa Tam's spotlight report for 2019 focused on the problem of AMR and the need to limit unnecessary use to preserve antibiotics for the future. It aims to educate healthcare professionals and the general public on the importance of using antibiotics wisely and the need for targeted programs to combat AMR so that we can preserve antibiotics now and for future generations. So now that we've set the stage for the scale of the issue with AMR, I want to look at the importance of community stewardship programs. So hospital stewardship programs are very common, but you might not be as familiar with community stewardship programs. So I'll start with differentiating community from hospital stewardship programs. So those familiar with the stewardship programs can see the differences. So on the left side of this table is common attributes of hospitals, um, antimicrobial stewardship programs, while the right is about community stewardship programs. So the first difference you'll see is the amount of antimicrobial prescriptions. You can see that the majority of prescribing happens in primary care and community settings, not acute care. It's important to note that hospital-based prescribing is more likely to be life and death, looking from a client-based perspective, but overall the percentages of use are much different. And because the bulk of prescribing happens in the community, it's a proven way to combat AMR. 
And the second difference you'll notice is the number of prescribers. So due to the scale of community stewardship programs, it might actually cost more to run a community program than a hospital program, but it reaches a much larger audience. So the per capita costs are actually lower. So in our experience in BC and Alberta, community programs can be delivered for between about six and 13 cents per capita. And in community settings, there's many types of prescribers when you consider GPs, um, nurse practitioners, midwives, dentists, naturopaths, and other healthcare pro professionals. And in a hospital setting, it can be easier to regulate prescriber behavior because there's oversight in place from the hospital organization, there's formal policies and feedback procedures. Um, the professional colleges of the healthcare um, practitioners in community do maintain the safety of the public in relation to the member's practice, but specific policy changes can be more challenging. However, in many cases, providing education and supports on best practice prescribing helps to change prescriber behavior over time. Um, so in the community setting, public outreach and education is core to the program. Whereas in hospital stewardship programs, um, patient education and outreach is, is less present. So this graph here is um, from the Canadian Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Systems Report, or the CARS report. And this report is to show the difference in the volume of antimicrobials prescribed in community settings, which are in blue, versus hospital settings, which are in red. So on the x-axis, it shows different years from 2015 to 2019. And on the y-axis um, is the uh, amount of uh, antimicrobials dispensed. So you can see the volume difference, which is what we talked about in the last table, is that um, community prescribing does make up the bulk of the antimicrobials that are dispensed. This histogram is also from the CARS report, and it shows the defined daily dose of antimicrobials per 1,000 inhabitants um, on the y-axis. And then on the axis this, on the x-axis this time, each bar is the provinces and territories. So you can see the colors in each bar are the classes of antibiotics. And the data um, from this report for BC correlates well with our program's independent analysis of community utilization in BC. So the data from these reports would support provincial community stewardship programs as it could be used to monitor the impact of interventions over multiple years. The data is from the data in this um, histogram is from hospital and community use, but because we just saw that the majority of um, the volume is from community use, the trends from large scale community changes would be apparent when you looked over successive years. So now I'll talk a little bit more about community stewardship programs that we have in BC and Alberta. And in BC, this is part of the BC Center for Disease Control. And in Alberta, it's part of the Alberta Health Services. So as Edith mentioned, the Do Bugs Need Drugs was founded um, in 1998 in Grand Prairie, Alberta. And it was a pilot project that leveraged partnerships and community champions to spread awareness of AMR and it used health promotion to decrease sickness. The Do Bugs Need Drugs materials were created for the general public. In 1999, the Do Bugs Need Drugs program expanded to Edmonton. And in 2000, they also started programming and resources for healthcare professionals. In 2013, Do Bugs Need Drugs was incorporated into the Alberta Health Services. And Dr. David Patrick imported Do Bugs Need Drugs to BC in 2005 as part of the BC Center for Disease Control. And in 2015, the program expanded to the Community Antimicrobial Stewardship Team at BC CDC, and we launched the Antibiotic Wise Public Awareness Initiative. And our Community Antimicrobial Stewardship Team has four main goals. The first goal is to decrease the overuse and misuse of antibiotics in community settings in BC. 
The second goal is that with the judicious use of antibiotics, there's a decrease in the existence or spread of resistant organisms because of less selection pressure on the bacteria. The decrease in unnecessary antibiotic use also decreases the unintended harms of antibiotics, such as secondary C. diff infections. And as we promote judicious antibiotic use, we also need to ensure that antibiotics are accessible when they're needed and that there are no harms associated with untreated bacterial infections. So our team has been studying this and the initial results look promising that we've not seen increases in pneumonia, sepsis, mastoiditis, complicated UTI, or other bacterial conditions that could have been missed as antibiotic use has decreased in BC over time. So we're continuing to monitor this as part of an ongoing part of our program. So in order to meet our goals, we categorize our interventions into these four areas, public awareness, public education, professional education, and research and surveillance. So I'll give a little bit of information on each of the types of interventions to give some examples of the work we do. For public awareness, um, I'm, I have a few examples here up on the slide, and this is one of the main components of our program, which is outreach directly to the public. So through television ads, um, like you see here, that's um, ad with Dr. Bonnie Henry, we have information um, on TVs in waiting rooms and clinical settings, transit ads and social media. We've helped spread messaging about the importance of hand washing, that antibiotics don't work against viruses, and to use antibiotics wisely. So this is an effort to build knowledge among the general public, hopefully leading to illness prevention and decreased requesting by uh, decreased requesting of antibiotics by the public when visiting their healthcare provider. Antibioticwise.ca is our main online presence in BC for quick, simple messaging around antibiotics and antibiotic resistance for the general public. And we're also on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram so that messages can be shared and spread for health promotion. And another key to successful stewardship programs is working with healthcare professionals who prescribe antibiotics in community or primary care settings. So this can include prescribers such as physicians, dentists, midwives, naturopaths, nurse practitioners, and even allied professionals who might not prescribe um, such as registered nurses, LPNs, healthcare aides, and early childhood edu educators. And the allied healthcare providers who don't prescribe help with keeping consistent messages to the public and promoting best practice by understanding AMR and the importance of infection prevention and control and the need for careful review before antibiotic prescribing. We have an online learning hub module, um, which is for continuing education, um, and it's available and free across Canada. It's at the antibioticwise.ca forward slash course, and it's targeted to family physicians, NPs, and pharmacists, and there's short modules on common infections seen in primary care settings, and it shares the evidence-based guidelines for treatment. Um, we also, uh, something else that we do for professional education that we're looking at is prescribing profiles. So we're currently looking at collaborating with other professional bodies to allow individuals to see how their prescribing practices differ from provincial trends and hopefully leads to changes in behavior and alignment with current guidelines. Um, a very important tool for professional education that we have is the Bugs and Drugs Online Reference Guide and app which compiles the up-to-date antibiotic prescribing guidelines for quick and easy access for practitioners. So this is available free in BC and Alberta and is based on the antibiograms from BC and Alberta. For public education, we have free online lesson plans at AntibioticWise and Do Bugs Need Drugs website. And these are for post-secondary healthcare professional students, um, public health nurses or teachers, and it allows them to provide lessons directly to the public. And for the sessions geared towards children, the children bring home an information flyer for the parents to read, so the intervention also reaches the family home. 
Um, the lessons vary depending on the age of the learner and the school age lessons align with the provincial curriculum. We ask those who have taught to report back to us on the number of participants from the teaching. So there's likely some under reporting, but since the start of the program in, in 2005, we've had over 140,000 BC residents receive the Dubuque's New Drugs teaching. And for research and surveillance, we have an antimicrobial utilization dashboard on the BC CDC website that reviews community antimicrobial usage. So it's available for our internal program planning and also available to other healthcare providers or the public who are interested. And through this dashboard, you can see overall prescribing trends and there's an ability um, to filter by different demographics and values to see trends in antibiotic usage. So for example, if you search by age group, you can see big declines in antibiotic usage in kids under one year old and kids one to four years old. You can also see increases in usage for people 80 years of age and older. Um, and you can also see a trend of a big decline for respiratory tract infections and skin and soft tissue infections since 2005, but not for UTI. But because the respiratory tract infections account for the majority of antibiotic prescribing, we have made progress on the biggest driver of prescribing in community. So now that we've looked at some of the interventions, we'll review their impacts to show the program's success since implementation. So on the x-axis of this graph is the years starting at 1996, and the y-axis is the prescription rate per 1,000 people per year. And the pink line shows when our program started in 2005 in BC. So you can see that antimicrobial usage has been dropping in BC steadily since the program was introduced. And if we look at some finer data, we can see that there have been even bigger results in younger age groups. So on this graph, again, we have the years on the bottom starting at 1996 and ending at 2020. And then on the y-axis is the prescription rate per 1,000 people per year. And each of the colored lines is a different age group with the teal line being kids under one year old and the pink line is kids from one to four years old. Um, and you can see that for kids under one year old, there's been a 66% decrease in antibiotic usage from 2005 to 2019. We left 2020 out of the percentage decrease calculations because of the effect of the pandemic. And then for the pink line, you can see there's been a 55% decrease in use from 2005 to 2019. So prescribing for those under the age of five has decreased dramatically since 2005. And our team also conducts research and surveillance on antibiotic use for community prescribers to identify ways to collaborate and support prescribers for meaningful interventions. So you can see on this graph, there are two different Y axes. Um, they both are the prescription rate per 1,000 people per year but the axis on the left is for um, all of the prescribers except for the physicians. And you can see, um, so that's for the dentist, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, naturopaths, midwives, podiatrists, and optometrists. And it, the um, y-axis on the right is a tenfold increase in amount. It's the same scale, it's just tenfold higher. And that's for the teal line for physicians. Um, we don't really have to um, worry too much about the exact amounts, but what we're looking more at is the trends over time. So since 1996, there's been a 38% decrease in prescribing by physicians. Um, and although the volume is much higher because um, there are more GPs in the community and they, are, they do have a wider scope of practice, um, but there has been a 25% increase by dentists although that is starting to come down and we've been doing more partnering to provide resources um, for dentists with that. And we have seen increases in the other professions, um, but the increases are largely due to their increasing scope of practice and the increased number of practitioners. Another important outcome to look at is cost savings. 
So the decreases in community antimicrobial prescribing across a provincial level results in a huge cost savings to the healthcare system. So when you look at the drug savings alone in BC, so this is the um, graph on the, right, on the left, we've saved $83.6 million in one year. And two thirds of that cost savings is volume reduction. And one third is class switching from more expensive medications to newer um, macrolides and less expensive penicillins and tetracyclines. So in the years from 2005 to 2014, which is the numbers on the right of the screen, you can see that the program saved almost $450 million on drug costs alone from 2005 to 2014. So for every dollar spent on community program activities, over $76 are saved in healthcare spending. And it's important to note that this is a conservative estimate, estimate because it only takes into account the drug costs and not the unintended consequences <clears throat> of antibiotic use when they're unnecessary. The cost saving of the stewardship programs amplifies when we look at what the costs would be of unintended harms attributed to antibiotic use when either an antibiotic wasn't warranted or when you would expect resolution just as quickly without an antibiotic. So the first category of savings would be avoiding adverse drug events. So the drug hypersensitivity reactions make up about 20% of adverse drug events and are found in about 8% of the general population. Non-immunological non -immunolo reactions such as headache or fatigue following antibiotic administration can lead to an incorrect allergy label. And if this is in the patient's medical chart, um, the reaction adds to the cost and complexity of healthcare. And if it's preventable in each case when an unnecessary antibiotic is avoided. C. diff is an opportunistic affection that can follow antibiotic use. And while all antibiotics have the potential to put patients at risk of developing a C. diff infection, the broad spectrum of antibiotics have been shown to present the highest risk due to the depletion of the gut microbiome. Vaginal infections such as candida and bacterial vaginosis are the most common gynecological diagnoses in primary care. And an antibiotic can alter the balance of the microflora causing a dysbiosis. So avoiding the unnecessary antibiotic use and when antibiotics are necessary, choosing the narrowest spectrum to clear the infection can help prevent these infections from occurring. And a reduction in the incidence of pediatric asthma has been observed in recent years and may be an unexpected benefit of prudent antibiotic use during infancy because of preserving the gut microbial community. So increasing evidence in the research by Dr. Hannah Lishman and Dr. David Patrick and others shows that if you disturb that initial seeding and colonization of the infant gut at the crucial time of the immune system development can put the infant at a higher risk of developing hyperreactive hyper immune responses to allergens later in childhood, leading to conditions such as asthma and allergy. Antibiotic exposure is one of the key causes of microbial dysbiosis in infants. So the study from our team found that children who were exposed to antibiotics in infancy were over two times more likely to develop asthma in childhood than children who weren't exposed. So this remains significant after adjusting for other possible explanatory factors, such as air pollution, genetic factors, and mode of birth. And previously we saw the antimicrobial use dashboard. We also have an antimicrobial resistance dashboard. So one of the main outcomes of our stewardship program is slowing the spread of resistance. This dashboard looks at the combination of bugs and drugs to show susceptibility or resistance of an organism to the different antimicrobials. So the rows are different types of bacteria and the columns are um, different antibiotics. So where they meet shows the effectiveness of that drug to that bug. The colors indicate susceptibility with green showing susceptible and yellow showing growing resistance. 
and the R indicating resistance. The numbers inside the colored boxes show the percent susceptible. So a decreasing number means that the antibiotic is becoming less effective. The AMR dashboard can be used to look at trends over time and to monitor different organisms of concern. Bacterial strains that develop or acquire resistance to one or more first-line antimicrobials pose numerous challenges to healthcare, including increased patient morbidity and mortality, increased drug costs, prolonged illness duration, and more expensive disease control measures. These antimicrobial resistant strains arise because of antimicrobial use that selects for the resistant organisms. Community stewardship programs promoting wise antibiotic use contribute to slowing that resistance. And this table is from the report when antibiotics fail, and it shows how AMR can negatively affect social and population well being. This table presents estimates for three resistance scenarios listed in the rows. So the first row is resistant to first line antimicrobials remaining constant at 26%. The second row is if resistance reaches 40% by 2050. And the third row is 100% resistance by 2050. And the authors of the report consider the 40% resistance scenario highly plausible, while the 100% resistance rate by 2050 represents the worst case scenario. The estimates for the column of population decline in 2050 are average annual declines in population. And the cumulative estimate in the next column is for the period of 2018 to 2050. And preventable deaths represent the number of lives that could be saved if resistance does not grow to 40% or if it does not grow to 100%. So if actions are not taken to combat the increase of AMR, Canada will be greatly changed within a few decades. The healthcare system will be less sustainable and social inequity will further increase. So now that we've reviewed the benefits of having a provincial um, antimicrobial stewardship program on individual and public health levels, we can talk a little bit more in broader terms about some of the steps to start a community stewardship program. So this is a summary of what we're aiming to achieve. And this list can be used as a reference or tool to look at what strengths and opportunities there are, as well as what areas there are to develop. So for governance, we already have a national action plan and practice level policies in Canada. And if we skip down to prescribing guidelines, these also already exist in many areas, such as the Orange Book in Ontario. And if we look further down at research, we've covered how surveillance on antimicrobial usage is also done on a federal level for the provinces with the CARS report. So areas to start developing could include the categories of education, monitoring, and engagement. And a good first step could be engaging with prescribers and local stakeholders to determine the best methods of health promotion and education to prescribers and the public. These areas can be met more developed um, over time as programs evolve and grow. And these are some suggested resources for a community antimicrobial stewardship program. And although they don't have to all be present at the start of the program, this could help as an aim for what to work towards. So we have a part-time physician lead with possibly an infectious disease background. Um, program project management, an educator, <clears throat> epidemiologist or analyst for tracking trends and appropriateness of prescribing, um, and access to management and communication resources, which can sometimes be from the host organization. Um, it's important to have a guidelines coordinator, which would possibly be a, a pharmacist, and an advisory group on guidelines, which could be done with volunteer time from committed practitioners. And our team at the BCCDC works so well as we have many different disciplines represented who all play an integral role and have expertise in different areas. When we do our work, we're able to find champions in different parts of healthcare to help make necessary changes. 
And both the Alberta and BC programs started by leveraging community champions and using existing infrastructure where available to embed the community stewardship into existing public health programming. So it can be beneficial to look for solutions within your province, for example, by collaborating with post-secondary institutions or possibly public health nurses who already work in schools or community settings, possibly primary care clinics. So these could be important first steps to creating larger programs over time. It's also important to differentiate between a campaign and a program. It takes a lot of time to see the results and interventions. So single campaigns are not nearly as effective as programs that run over successive years. Building a program enables trends to lower over time and real progress can be made towards combating antimicrobial resistance. So I wanted to highlight that there are lesson plans and public and prescriber handouts and education materials on the Antibiotic Wise and Do Bugs Need Drugs websites that could be adapted for local use. The Public Health Agency of Canada email above is for the AMR task force team, and they can direct you, direct you to potential local resources or information from the CARS report for your jurisdiction. <clears throat> Community antimicrobial stewardship programs help to target one of the most pressing global public health threats. Efforts to reduce unnecessary antibiotic prescribing reduce the threat from emergent resistant organisms and the adverse effects from unnecessary drug exposure. And while most of the conversation on stewardship focuses on hospital and agricultural use, 80 to 90% of human antibiotic use occurs in the community. <clears throat> Programs that focus on both the prescriber guidance and public education in the community have been shown to successfully reduce antibiotic use at the population level. Community antibiotic stewardship programs are cost saving, even when you consider drug costs alone. And there is growing evidence that reducing antibiotic use, especially in infancy, may significantly reduce the incidence of childhood asthma. So cost savings alongside improved health outcomes make community stewardship programs a necessary investment. Provincial health systems would save costs and lives and decrease social inequities by instituting antibiotic stewardship efforts in the community. So I wanted to acknowledge the other members of our team who do amazing work on research, surveillance, analysis, leadership, and knowledge translation. And we also partner with experts from other disciplines such as pharmacy and dental for their knowledge and expertise. I also just wanted to acknowledge that this funding was made possible through the Public Health Agency of Canada and to thank the National Collaborating Center for Infectious, Infectious Diseases for hosting the webinar and for translation and interpretation services. Um, the list of references is here. It's very small, um, but it will be on the PDF that is emailed out if you um, would like to look at any of the references. And we're happy to take questions either for me um, Dr. Edith Blondell Hill or our BC Program Manager Nick Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And I see Nick has joined us as well. Uh, hi, Nick, uh, helping answer questions as well. Thank you, Kate, Edith. This was a, a very excellent presentation, a compelling um, program with Do Bugs Me Drugs. And I think that's that's often been um, uh, held up and discussed in Canada. I know that um, participants will be interested in uh, gaining a, a little, little more insight. And um, so I ask you to turn to the Q&A pod at the bottom of your page. I see we already have one question there. So um, uh, as I do, uh, before I turn to the questions, I just want to point out that the the blue screens you see popping up in front of you are um, part of a World Health Organization color campaign, Go Blue, and uh, uh, Canada Canadian collaborators are participating 
uh, and making efforts to light landmarks blue and uh, and backgrounds on events like this blue in recognition that this event is part of World Antimicrobial Awareness uh, Week. So uh, I want to turn to our Q&A now um, with no further delay. Uh, Andrea has asked a question, are you able to share your data on outcomes for other provinces to make a case for community antimicrobial stewardship or those programs? Kate? Okay, so I might start the answer to this question and then hand it over to Nick. Um, I think some of what I talked about with cost savings, those papers are published, and I think that is a compelling reason um, to implement a community program is the is the cost savings that that could be, happen. Um, and the report of when antibiotics fail does talk about the social um, implication and lives lost. And Nick, I don't know if you want to add anything else about where some of this data could be found. Um, yeah, the other thing I would just say in terms of uh, like our antimicrobial utilization um, uh, data is available, as, as Kate mentioned, on uh, dashboards that are available on the BCCDC website. And so we can make sure I can even put links into the chat for that as well. And they are... Um, uh, interactive, you know, you can click through and highlight and filter by a variety of methods to get, um, you know, whatever information you're looking for, but uh, they're publicly available and a great resource for a lot of the, the data that we have to work with on the outcomes of our program. Thank you. Thank you both. All right. And um... And seeing, seeing no immediate questions come up, uh, I wanted to pick up on a, a, a statement you made, Kate, about um, the opportunity to reduce social inequities. And um, and I know you're that's a, a keen interest for, for you. Are you able to, what are the strategies that uh, maybe you'll just clarify that actually improve social equity? And or are your results um, that showed, for example, 140,000 residents were, were um, uh, received education, uh, uh, that material, is there anything to, to back up what kind of um, equitable distribution, maybe rural or uh, a lower resourced community? Um, I think for all the public health professionals on the call will um, know and understand that public health threats often do affect um, disproportionately when they happen. So this is something that similar to other public health emergencies would affect people disproportionately. Um, and the teaching that we do in schools is wonderful because it is broad um, it reaches many different audiences in all areas of the province. And when we do have um, people go in to teach, we always let them know that the information that goes home to families is available in many different languages. So many of the kids speak English going through the school system, but their families at home may not. So we just have the um, person teaching check in with the teacher to see what language the family speaks at home. And then the materials are sent home in that language so that we can help to um, reach people in, in different ways. So yes, th thank you, Kate. And I see other questions coming in. We're gonna to turn to the uh, chat pod, or the, sorry, Q and A. And uh, from Kim Abbas, there's a, she sees a, a veterinary representative. And has there been collaboration with uh, veterinarians with this group in your program? I'll pass that on to Nick to answer. Yeah, sure. Um, so I mean, the, the focus of our program is very much human health and it, and it always has been. But that being, that being said, we do collaborate um, fairly closely with uh, partners in other sectors in both, you know, veterinary or agriculture as well as environment. Uh, Dr. Erin Fraser is the public health veterinarian at the BCCDC, and uh, she does work quite closely with our program, or at least uh, pre-COVID worked fairly closely with our program, um, um, and was particularly interested in uh, stewardship initiatives for, for pets or companion animals as being a um, kind of a 
um, something kind of caught in between that wasn't necessarily being addressed on kind of the agriculture side, but wasn't being addressed on the human health side either. Um, so that's work that's still underway and we're very interested in continuing with Aaron. And the other thing is that we do work with colleagues, um, as I said, from agriculture and, and the environment and have recently started up uh, a bit of a regular meeting of uh, colleagues from all of those those areas um, to bring kind of a One Health perspective to the work we do. I don't think uh, it, it will never be a focus of our program, but we are very much uh, interested in opportunities for collaboration with other partners in other sectors. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Kate. Another question, and uh, I'll read it out also to help the, the, the interpreter. I've heard a campaign from UK about being an antibi antibiotic guardian, and people are starting to pledge being a guardian. Hope this will be a global campaign too, so that many countries could reach, uh, especially from the poor countries that has have little knowledge or, or no knowledge about AMR and AMS. So that's a, a, a comment. Uh, does anyone want to pick up on the on the comment? Um, I just wanted to add that I think it's also important to put a human face to this. There's a lot of statistics. The terms are very scientific and can be confusing. And I think it can really resonate with the public to, to hear stories and to hear um, something that is very relatable and understandable. Yes, and, uh, and, and uh, Edith, yeah, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to add that uh, when we were really into our daycare program, our daycare uh, programs would put a, um, a certificate to say that we are stewards of antimicrobial stewardship through the Duba Clean Drugs Program. And so that, that in a way is a bit of an antimicrobial guardian, anti-stewardship guardian as well. So I think the more the public recognizes the messages of the program, the more they, uh, they will be attuned to um, organizations that promote it, promote antimicrobial stewardship. And, um, and when we started the program, it was quite interesting to see how many um, doctors mentioned that um, instead of coming to ask for an antibiotic, patients were coming to say, I want to make sure I don't need an antibiotic. So it's a whole mind change that has to occur in a population, but it is doable. Thanks, Edith. Yes, yeah, so having a, a pledge is one thing and having it uh, actually uh, facing the public and also behind your prescriber in the clinic, um, really making that, connecting that message at the at the interface with with people with uh with patients very good i'll just uh look to the next question what can grad uh graduating pharmacy student do to participate in the program or help create a saskatchewan community program maybe a, a tough question for you to answer and and yet starting off from from uh the front lines in pharmacy what can what can you share uh, as encouragement for a Saskatchewan pharmacist. I'm, I'm glad there's interest. That is certainly the, the points I think of this webinar was to create some um, excitement around community stewardship in other jurisdictions. And certainly I think what I, I hope is that maybe there's some people in this webinar who are the decision makers who are able to kind of um, take the lead on implementing something like this in, in their jurisdiction. So for a, a graduating pharmacy student, I would just say, be in touch with the powers that be, keep advocating for such a program, and, um, and hopefully we can start to see these things grow across the country. Great. Edith? Um, pharmacists are having an expanded role in many parts of Canada, including in prescribing. And pharmacists have actually been shown to be more guideline focused than even physicians. So I think pharmacists have a huge opportunity to be leaders in uh, antimicrobial stewardship, both at the community and the hospital level. So uh, I think that um, to get involved, as Nick says, to be aware of the references that are available to, to um, 
it's not just the Dubai's new drugs program. Uh, nationally, we started a symptom-free P. Let it be campaign to address asymptomatic bacteria. So very often, patients seek pharmacists as their first-line healthcare workers, and that's going to be even more as as we uh, have uh, more restrictions in healthcare. So so I think that um, the program is perfect for pharmacists. And I think that they will continue to play a huge role in um, antimicrobial stewardship in the future. Thank you, Edith. Uh, moving to Yvonne's question, do you have a connection to health science programs? Uh, I think we need to make students, medicine, pharmacy, dentistry, et cetera, aware before they graduate from their programs. Do you see a role for students doing the, doing the education in, uh, in schools, for example. So Kate. Yeah, so that is one of the main parts of my job is um, educating healthcare professionals in post-secondary schools. Um, and then they go out and teach the do bugs new drugs in um, elementary schools. So they get the education before they graduate, which is a time when they can really absorb and learn and have that capacity. And then they go out and teach. Um, so the children get healthy habits starting at a young age. And then the kids bring home the information to their families. So it's really this tri-fold um, benefit when I teach one group of healthcare professionals. Um, and I would say it's not just prescribers too, teaching the daycare workers, teaching healthcare aides so that all of our healthcare partners are on the same page, I think is really important. So it can be a great way to think about starting a program is what um, opportunities are there to embed this into um, post-secondary um, programs where it might fit, whether that's in a community nursing um, uh, rotation or if it's through a pediatric rotation where they're learning how to teach children. So there's multiple ways that it can fit in the curriculum um, and it can be a very inexpensive way to reach a lot of people. Thank you, Kate. Just bringing in another question as we wait for uh, any additional questions in the Q&A. Where does antibiotic resistance usually fit in the nursing curriculum? Have, have you touched on that, Kate? Yeah, so there are a few areas where it can fit, like I talked about through a community um, rotation. Something that's been really nice to see um, that's a current trend in BC is that the registered nursing students and the licensed practical nurse students are having more collaboration throughout their schooling. And a nice place that I've seen a curriculum fit with a lot of schools is to have the um, primary, the practical nurses and the registered nurses collaborate together um, to learn the do bugs need drugs material, to learn about resistance together, and then to partner to go out um, into the community and teach together. Um, so it helps build those partnerships across programs and um, helps spread the messages as well. So there are um, many different ways that it can fit. Um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, whether that's community care as well or pediatrics. Okay, thank you. And just seeing that we have a couple of minutes only left, uh, I'm gonna squeeze in this, uh, a good question on a small budget. On a small budget, how would you start a program? That's where, Kate, can you uh, tackle that one enough? Yeah, um, Edith, I don't know if you would like to do this question or I can, having had experience starting a program. Sure. Well, I think you need to find passionate people and those are not that hard to find. And I, I think how we started with uh, pharmacists and nurses was, and, and all of it was um, really voluntary through where they were working. So um, we, it was through the U of A, through uh, hospital uh, stewardship, through um, and, and throughout the Alberta Lung Association. So all associations that were interested. But I think to start, you do need to have, need to have a few champions and somebody who takes a bit of the lead. Um, but, but I think if you have a nurse educator, that, that's our, you know, the biggest bang 
for your buck, I think, because you, as, as Kate showed, you can, uh, we, in Alberta, we had a really good program where all healthcare disciplines got together for 36 hours to learn about each other's profession. And they, uh, we use six hours of that time, three hours to teach them, three hours to go out and teach children. So it, it, it didn't cost very much and we were able to exponentially teach that way. So I would say a nurse educator is absolutely uh, important. And I think uh, a physician who is a champion to um, have some credibility with um, other physicians um, in, in um, teaching them about better antimicrobial stewardship, duration of therapy, et cetera. And then, um, and then of course, getting involved. Uh, at the next level is to have a manager, to be able to, uh, an administrator to start the program uh, properly, and then to start involving all the different associations, the nursing associations, the pharmacists associations, the physicians associations, the, the nurse practitioners, et cetera, and then education go to the um, daycare uh, societies, et cetera. So it, it, I think that's the order that, that I would start. But at the beginning, you just have to have a team that is committed, that is not worried about where, it, it's a, there's a lot of work at the beginning to get it going. But um, if everyone's on an equal footing, uh, you can achieve a lot, I think. All right. Thank you, Edith, and that's that's been inspiring, and so has your presentation. And uh, there's, of course, so much more to be said about this program. Um, but thank you for sharing. We will be posting the slides and um, uh, the recorded presentation on NCCID's website. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Edith Belindel Hill, Kate O'Connor. This has been a fabulous presentation. And um, I invite people to, uh, to look for the uh, emails coming out with, the, uh, with an evaluation. Please provide us feedback on this presentation. It'd be very helpful. And uh, yeah, thank you all for joining us.